Hey there, Carl Pierre here, co-founder of Passive Workforce. Our mission is to empower entrepreneurs like you to start, grow, and ultimately sell your companies. We believe that a great business is one of the best ways to create lasting wealth. And today, I wanna to share with you an important strategy that can help you achieve just that. Selling your business can be a game changer, but it's not as simple as putting a for sale sign on the front door. There's a strategic approach to maximize the value of your company and ensure that you get top dollar when it's time to move on from that business. With my experience as the owner of a home care agency and medical staffing agency, I've had the unique opportunity to be involved in all aspects of building, selling, and buying companies. I've learned invaluable lessons along the way, and now I'm here to pass that knowledge on to you. So if you're ready to unlock the secrets of building a business that commands a premium price when you're ready to part ways, stick around. This video is packed with insight and practical tips that will set you up on a path for success. Let's dive in and discover the keys to building a valuable and sellable business. A crucial element in building a valuable and sellable business is maintaining good accounting and financial practices. Having a clear understanding of your company's financial health and being able to provide accurate information to potential buyers is essential. In this section, we'll explore the importance of reliable accounting and discuss how it can impact you significantly and the value of your business. By establishing robust financial records, you'll be able to showcase the financial stability and transparency of your company, making it more attractive to prospective buyers, especially the big boys that are in this game. Now, I've been in a number of transactions on the sell side and the buy side, and I have to say one of the biggest killers of all transactions or the thing that actually gets you beat up on price are your financial records. Now, a lot of us who get into business often neglect accounting because we look at that as just like tedious work. It doesn't really matter to the bottom line. If we know how much money we're making, we're happy. Also, a lot of things that small business owners do to kind of offset their tax liability can ultimately affect you because you're gonna have to kind of recast your financials to add all of those seller discretionary earnings back to your total price. What do I mean by that? So let's just say that your business was able to make a million dollars net per year, but you expensed out construction in your home, you got yourself a Range Rover or a lease, you travel a lot, and you run it all through your business so that you can bring down your taxable income. By doing this, it's not really good because your tax returns are gonna show all of these expenses and your net earnings are gonna look a lot smaller than what they could truly be if the owner wasn't kind of poaching money from the business. This is why having good financial advice and good financial records is going to kind of prepare you to kind of put the best foot forward when you're doing a transaction. You really want to be working off of true earnings. And one of the terms that they use in this business is EBITDA. So that's earnings before taxes, interest, appreciation, and amortization. So it's your true net. So this is how all businesses are generally evaluated. If you have to kind of go back off of this blend of financials between the owner using money from the company, et cetera, it's going to be termed SDE or seller's discretionary earnings, right? So those are the ad backs that are going to have to be placed on your financials to make the numbers make sense to get the biggest number. Again, it's kind of a turnoff because you don't know how genuine it is. You don't know if there's ever going to be an audit down the line that you might be on the hook for. So believe me, when it comes to running your financials properly, you should. Another thing to consider about financials is the quality of the record keeping. So a lot of people might hire a accountant to, to do bookkeeping and they'll do all of their compilations at the end of the year. So things aren't categorized properly. There aren't good receipts and records being maintained. And again, these are things that you could get picked apart on. So you want to have your tax system and your financial system set to an accrual basis, first of all, because that's the general standard in accounting, you're gonna to want it to be accrual. And then what you're gonna to want to do is make sure that everything is categorized and filed, all your revenue, all your expenses, everything is clean. And that's going to take a financial team. It's not gonna just be your bookkeeper at your accounting office pulling <laughs> your bank statements from your one banking account and reconciling everything. Believe me, I've seen all this and it's bad because there was one deal that I was working on that they had a million dollars that could have been added to their bottom line that they misrepresented. And it was causing them to have their valuation reduced, which is a good thing for a buyer, horrible thing for a seller. So you wanna make sure that you don't have those inaccuracies in your financial information because 
If you inflated the numbers, for example, a proper buyer is going to recast everything and see that that number is not accurate. And they're going to reduce the negotiated price and the deal is going to most likely die, right? Because your expectation is going to be set to the number that the broker has already put in your head. If they do the recast and they see that the business has a higher valuation or higher net cash flow than what you're actually representing, they win. So they're going to not only negotiate the price in their favor based on the on the value that you're presenting, but they're also going to immediately have upside. What can this mean? So for the business that I was looking at, that $1 million difference would have been $4 million of net value to our bottom line immediately just by cleaning the books. We could have bought that, cleaned it up, and resold it for $4 million more in six months just by accurately representing the financial information. So this shows you how important it is. That's $4 million to the bottom line difference just because they had rinky-dinky accounting. You don't want to be in that department. You don't want to have to deal with that. You want to have clean books so that you get accurate representation of your business so there isn't any kind of pushback. The best thing that you could have are audited financials from a reputable firm. I'm not talking about the big four. You don't need that for most transactions, but just a firm that understands your business, that has a good reputation in your city, have them audit your financials annually. It's going to drive the value or the cost, I should say, of your, your operating expenses by a few thousand dollars. We're talking about maybe between twelve and 25000 depending on how complex things are. But if you're audited and they put that stamp of approval on your financials, it gives buyers from the private equity space a lot of comfort in reviewing those financials because they can then go to that auditor and get some clarification on how did they calculate the valuation and how did they do the books for that business. Imagine having a business that can thrive even in your absence. Implementing systems that operate independently of you as the owner is key to creating a valuable and sellable business. We have to talk about the significance of building scalable and automated processes within your company. By establishing efficient systems, you not only reduce dependency on you and the direct involvement of the owner, but also enhance the appeal of your business to potential buyers. Most buyers when buying your business are either going to purchase the entire operation or just the cash flow generating assets. If they're buying the entire operation, they want management to be rock solid because what they're thinking is they're just going to step in as the owner, as a board member, as someone who gives direction to the business. They don't necessarily want to buy a business that they need to work in, right? That That's buying a job, not buying a business. So your business needs to have good management in place. And in order for management to thrive, your business needs to have good systems in place. So if you look at McDonald's, for example, McDonald's doesn't have the best burgers. They have some of the best systems out there to actually manage these franchises so that they're able to reproduce the Big Mac the same everywhere that they serve them because it's all about the systems. They focus their time on how long to toast the buns, how long to cook the meat, how much ketchup should be on the burger. All of those details are hashed out. So it makes the business a little foolproof so to speak. So if you have good systems in place and you're selling your business and you're the owner, but you had a, a working responsibility there, you were functioning as CEO or primary business development person, something along those lines. And if you can demonstrate that anybody with proper qualifications could step in and work the job and all the systems are there and regardless of who's in that role, they should be able to execute, that's a lot better for larger buyers. Smaller buyers who want to step in and, and operate the business may not care so much about your systems, but again, you're going to be dealing with smaller transactions and that's not really what's going to make you wealthy, right? It might make you the most money that you've ever made, but it's not going to get you into that $20, $50 million range that a lot of us are, are looking for. So you want to make sure that as you're building your business, as you're growing your business, you're always looking back and restructuring the business so that if a new buyer were to come in, you could clearly demonstrate how this business functions, who is responsible for what, and show them that if you were to leave for six months, a year, or if you were completely out of the business, the business will continue to operate without losing any value, without losing any of its revenue. So systems really matter. You can't just be the jack of all trades, managing everything in your business. Again, a lot of us are starting these businesses as our first business and we don't have that experience. So we just do everything ourselves. You don't want to do that. The sooner that you can kind of restructure your business so everything is systems-based, the better off you're going to be. You're going to be able to pass off 
those systems to whoever the new buyer is. Now, if it's an asset purchase and they're just purchasing your contracts, your patients, your, your business, but they could care less about the majority of the role players, they're just going to absorb that business into their primary company because they have systems in place and they know that they're probably more efficient than yours. So just be mindful of that. But either way, it's better to have systems. That way it's able to satisfy any type of buyer that's coming to the table. Determining the true value of your business and positioning it for maximum worth are vital when preparing for sale. We need to explore the intricacies of business valuations and how to strategically enhance the value of your company. Understanding the key factors that influence valuation and aligning your business accordingly will attract potential buyers and maximize your selling potential as well as your selling price. Most people don't know what their business is worth and they're gonna count on their broker or somebody external to them telling them. It's the same with any asset class, but the asset is usually valued based on a few different things. Either comparable sales, like it is with residential real estate, or the net operating income, or a combination of both. So in the world of selling businesses, the value is gonna be based on that EBITDA factor, which is its net operating income, and it's gonna be based on comparable sales within that industry. And another thing that changes is that, how big is the company? The valuation is going to adjust according to that. Let me give you an example of what I mean. If you're dealing with businesses that are doing less than a million dollars net, so 300,000, 500,000, let's use 500,000 as an example, okay? You're working with a company that is truly making $500,000 a year. That company might sell for anywhere between two times to four times that $500,000. So that means that that company's valuation based of its home health, healthcare staffing, based on the industries that I'm familiar with, that sub one million is gonna sell roughly between two and four, most likely settle out at three. So at half a million dollars net, that business could realistically sell between a million dollars and two million dollars because it's gonna be selling for two to four times earnings. And you could research other companies. You could even look at the publicly traded companies and see what they paid for some of those businesses because they'll, they'll make it public in certain situations that they acquired X, Y, and Z agency for X dollars, right? And you could just do the math and see, all right, this is how much they paid. They paid a 3X multiple, 4X multiple. There's also other databases that you could purchase. I'm not gonna shout anybody out now because they're not paying me. So, but there's other services that you can that you can actually research this information. So you look for your type of business. State might matter a little bit just because there's different laws in different states and that might adjust your, your valuation a bit. But you'll be able to see based on size what they're selling for. But as a rule of thumb, the larger your net cash flow gets, the higher and higher the multiple gets. And that's for a few reasons. The small EBITDA companies, like that sub $1 million range, they have a lower multiple because usually there's not many systems in place. The owner is doing a lot. It's, it's just kind of not a robust business, right? It's not a, not a true business, let's just say. It doesn't run itself. As you get above the $1 million range, so like from one to five million, you're usually seeing between four to like six times. And as you get closer and closer to $10 million, that starts to inch up to like five to eight times. Once you start getting above like the $20 million net range, you start looking at eight times to 10 times. So if you just do the simple math and you see what's happening in, in the marketplace, you can really get a good sense of what your business is worth by looking at the comparables, obviously understanding what your true net income is and applying the multiples that this business is trading for in the marketplace. A lot of the buyers who are coming in are going to do leverage buyouts, meaning they're going to buy your business with its own cash flow. And for the numbers to make sense, the higher the net cash flow is, the more lucrative it is because they have enough money to service the debt that they're purchasing you with. And at the same time, enough cash flow being spun off to make it attractive to the primary business or the, or the primary entity that's buying that business. And of course, they're gonna do strategic purchases for additional territory or uh, competing marketplaces or just services that they don't provide that they wanna get into that might be limited. For example, hospice services, there may be a certificate of need in place, but they'll purchase a hospice agency just to get into that vertical. Either way, the valuation is still gonna be determined by those factors. A tip that you can kind of use to model your business 
is look at the multiples and think about how do I build my business to earn X, Y, and Z net? Do I invest more in kind of our marketing team and sales team? Potentially. Do I buy some of the smaller players and consolidate so that I force my valuation up because now we're doing larger and larger numbers. This is your typical roll-up strategy. You go around purchasing at two and four X until you're able to command eight times, right? You, you buy $100 million worth of home care agencies doing roughly $20 million a year or 15 million or so. If you paid three X average on the acquisition side, you're gonna be able to get out for six to eight times when it's all said and done. So just by bringing them together. Now that sounds a lot easier than what it is because we're in the process of doing that ourselves. Very difficult. A lot of deals fail because of financials or just crazy owners, but this is what you could expect. To ensure proper financial management for your business, consider working with our partners at Healthcare Back Offices. From bookkeeping to payroll management, billing to comprehensive auditing, tax services, we got you covered. We provide the expertise that you need. Also, you can visit PassiveWorkforce.com to learn more about our services and schedule a one-on-one -on -one guidance session with our team. Take this opportunity to elevate your business and set yourself up for success. Don't forget, here at Passive Workforce, we help businesses start, grow, and eventually sell. So if you want more information just like this, make sure that you subscribe and check out our other videos for more useful tips.